This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 24 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you again for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. I really, really do appreciate it. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Well, when I say beautiful, it's still, it is beautiful up here, but right now we're in that mud season. It's a little rainy and overcast today, and so it's not quite as beautiful as, well, it's not picture perfect, shall we say. The pig pens and the chicken runs and all of that stuff, muddy, muddy messes, but it does seem that spring is here, that winter is a not so distant memory, um, but we're still in March, and so we will see whether or not we get another cold spell or not. But my hope is that those, those things are past. Uh, obviously, right now, at this time of uh, 2020, uh, when I'm recording this episode, we are dealing with this coronavirus thing, and I don't want to spend a lot of time dwelling on that today, um, but certainly we are being affected by that here in upstate New York with regards to um, job situations, and uh, so I completed this week, um, week number two, well, two and some change of working from home. Um, but I am very, very blessed that I am able to do that. And uh, thankfully, right now, things have not gotten too bad up here in upstate New York. Downstate, it seems like, is a bit of a different story. But I do hope that wherever you are listening from, you are well. Uh, and if you are under quarantine or if you are under um, social distancing policies and all of those kinds of things, that uh, you are doing what you can uh, and your best to be safe and to be healthy, and I do hope that your family is as well. With all of that said, let's jump right over to this week's Homestead Happenings because it has been a busy week here on the Homestead. Now, one of the things that uh, I I shared with you last week that I was very excited about with regards to all of the stay at home stuff that we're having to do is I was excited with the prospect of getting a lot of things done here on the homestead. I honestly have to tell you though, I have not gotten done as much as I thought I would. But having said that, we still have accomplished a lot here on the homestead. I just thought I'd have a little bit more done than what I do. But anyhow, let me run through some of the things that we have been doing here on the homestead. It is very exciting this time of the year. I absolutely love spring. Uh, I, I the, the hope of, of the coming year and the harvest um, is just something that I really, really enjoy. The smell of dirt in the air. I really, really enjoy it. And so, honestly, if I had to pick a favorite time of the year, it probably would be spring. Now, I do enjoy fall when we're enjoying the abundance of the harvest, provided that things have gone well. Um, but there's just something about spring and kind of that anticipation that you've had all winter long. And now all of that is really just getting underway and getting underway in a big way way. And that certainly has been what we've been experiencing here on the homestead this week. So we went ahead and got the brooder all set up, the mobile chicken coop. I've been sharing pictures of that on our Facebook and Instagram um, pages. And so in preparation of our chicks arriving this week, I went ahead and finished uh, up the mobile coop, got the divider up, shavings down, the Ohio brooders in place, and what I found is the 65 watt bulbs just weren't generating enough heat. And so I went ahead and went to um, a, a 150 watt bulb and a 65 watt bulb. And it still really wasn't getting getting there. 
And instead of running out and grabbing um, 100 watt or another 150 watt bulb, I just went ahead and threw the two heat lamps that I had um, on hand already and put those in there. And that really seems to have done the trick. Now, I do want to go back later on and fiddle around with maybe 150 watt bulbs in there just to reduce uh, energy consumption. Um, but having said that, <clears throat> I'm very, very happy with these Ohio brooders. The chicks did arrive this week, and they arrived very, very healthy. We did lose one, and the feed store where I bought the chicks replaced it right away. So I was very happy with that. Um, they're running around. Again, I put pictures up on Facebook and Instagram, so if you want to see those, uh, take a look there. Also on our YouTube channel, um, there's a short video segment that uh, my wife did. She works at a daycare, and uh, she normally goes in every Friday, and then she substitutes when um, when there's a sickness. But uh, because of the coronavirus thing, the daycare is on pause, and uh, the kids refer to Fridays as Miss Bonnie days. And so on Friday, she recorded a video, um, but we put it, decided to put it up and share it with everybody of the chicks arriving. And so if you want to take a look at that, that is on our YouTube channel. Um, you can see kind of the setup that we have and uh, how we bring chicks into uh, or onto our homestead. Um, <clears throat> we also got turkeys. Now I had ordered, I think it was seven broad-breasted whites from uh, through the feed store. And unfortunately, the poultry, uh, I'm not sure which hatchery they used, but shorted the feed store. Uh, and they only had one broad-breasted white and one bronze-breasted white. And so I told them I'd take them both. And uh, unfortunately, the bronze-breasted, um, when I, did I say bronze-breasted white? It's not a bronze-breasted. It's a broad, a bronze broad-breasted turkey. Yes. Get it right, Brian. Um, it unfortunately didn't make it, but I had seen that our local tractor supply had turkeys. So I ran over there and, uh, in New York state, a minimum purchase of six. So I went ahead and bought six and brought them home and they do seem to be doing well. I had hoped to switch to a heritage breed this year. It just didn't work out. And so, um, next year, there's always next year or maybe later on this year, I'll acquire um, some, but right now, broad breasted whites, we have seven of them and uh, they are in the brooder. This week, I also started some seeds. So Garden 2020 is underway here on 3B Farm and Homestead. I have planted some brassicas in the smaller Haas Garden Tool seed starting kit. Now, there are four, 24 cells in each of those trays. They have a dome on them. Uh, and in that, I started a variety of different broccolis and cauliflowers. I also, this week, started a variety of different tomatoes and peppers in the larger um, seed starting kit from Haas Tools. That, I think it's 168 cells. And so I started uh, peppers and tomatoes in that. And then in the Bootstrap Farmer, in two of the Bootstrap Farmer 1020 trays, I also started a variety of tomatoes and peppers. Let me start with my thoughts with regards to the smaller seed starting kit from Haas Tools. First of all, I absolutely love that when you buy that kit, it comes with a seed starting mix. I believe it's Pro Mix. Um, it comes with five quarts, and it's just about perfect for filling those seed starting trays right up. I made a rookie mistake, though. I filled them with the seed starting mix, and I proceeded to oversaturate that soil. And... So what I ended up doing is the water drained down through, I dumped it off, and I let those uh, trays sit out for a couple of days to actually dry out a little bit because I had oversaturated it so much. 
So that was my mistake. Definitely wasn't the uh, kit's mistake. Put the uh, brassicas in there, the seeds for the brassicas in there, put the domes on it, and it the humidity domes, this is the first time I've used them. And uh, very, very interesting, but you can definitely see the moisture there that's being, that normally would have evaporated into the air is being held inside the um, the, the seed starting trays and everything is starting to germinate. So, so far, so good. Really, really like that. Um, they, the, the kit fits together very well. The, 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 the seed trays sit down in the base very well, and then it'll provide me with an option of being able to water from the bottom. The seed, larger seed starting tray from Haas Tools, I, I kind of have a bit of a love hate relationship with it. Very easy to fill it with soil. Um, very easy to, uh, water it down. And if you remember my initial impressions on that were that I didn't like the fact that the tray, the bottom tray was larger than the, the seed tray itself, but I actually now kind of like it and I like it for a couple of reasons. Number one, I like it because as I was filling it with soil, I was doing this on my dining room table. My wife is a saint. Yes, she is. Um, but I did clean up my mess. <laughs> but as I was feeding, uh, filling that with soil, anything that was kind of over oh, spilling off the sides fell into the bait bottom tray. It wasn't getting all over the table like it did with the smaller, um, the smaller ones where the the uh, the seed starting tray fits tightly into the base. So that piece of it was very nice. It's also going to make it, I think, very easy to water from the bottom because instead of having to take the tray out or lift the tray up like I'm going to have to do with the smaller kits, I'll just be able to pour right into that bottom tray and never have to mess uh, with moving the seed starting uh, cells. But 168 168 cells. I really wasn't quite sure how to even approach that. Um, for, I think, the average gardener, that, quite frankly, is way overkill. Now, I am starting seeds for us. I'm starting seeds for my my mom and dad. But 168 tomatoes and, a you know, or tomatoes and peppers and a mixture of both, I'm never going to use all of those. Now, my plan from the get-go this year has been to grow more than I knew we were going to need so that I can either sell or maybe give away uh, plants to to friends and, and family. But it just seemed to me like it was just a little bit overkill for my needs here on our homestead. I had thought about potentially starting, you know, a couple of different rows uh, and then maybe waiting a couple of weeks and, and putting in uh, maybe some lettuce and, 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 and it's kind of staggering things out. But then I got to thinking, then the light requirements are going to be different. When it comes time to harden the plants off, that wouldn't work either because I would be maybe potentially wanting to harvest, um, harden off, I, I don't know, let's say the tomatoes that I started, but the lettuce wouldn't be ready. And that's probably a bad a bad description, but, but you get what I'm saying. It's just that you would have plants at different stages of growth and they have different light requirements and so forth. So uh, the jury's still out a little bit for me on that, just because I, I think the, it, it may be just a bit big, a bit too big for us, but time will tell overall, as far as its function, I have enjoyed it. Now, I do wish I had a humidity dome for it, and uh, I'm kind of, I've got some ideas on what I, I might do to uh, create a humidity dome for it, but uh, overall, I am pretty happy with it. Now, the 1020 trays from Bootstrap Farmer, these suckers, absolutely, I highly recommend them. Um, if you use 1020 trays, uh, yes, you can buy them at, for cheap at Walmart and Lowe's and Home Depot, but you know that they are junk, junk, junk. They are meant for a single use. And so then you are having to dispose of them. I don't like doing that. And so I would much rather spend a little extra money and get these very, very rugged 
um, nicely made trays than to uh, you know buy the El Cheapos. One of the things that I am doing this year, in the past what I have done is I have tried to squeeze in way too many soil blocks into my 1020 trays. What I would do is I would put out my, my because I have the uh, four, it makes four soil blocks. I think they're two inch, maybe two inch blocks. So what I would do is I would put in uh, a row using the four and then I would turn the, uh, the soil block maker sideways and get in another row so that I would have rows of five squished into these 1020 trays. The problem was is that because they were squished in there like that, the roots didn't air prune like the soil blocks are supposed to do. So this year I promised myself I wasn't going to do that. And so I only did uh, rows of four uh, down the the length of the 1020 trays and, and, and hopefully that's going to work out a little bit better for me. It's not going to be quite as jam packed in there. Now, certainly that means I'm going to get less, less plants in uh, a particular area, but I think overall for the health of the plants, it's going to be better. Now in my seed starting setup here, what I'm using is a metal baker's rack that I think I got maybe at Lowe's. It might even have been Walmart. I don't know, but very, very common. Um, and I have a video. I'll put a link to that, uh, our grow light system, uh, uh, a video that I put together a couple of years ago so that you can see what I'm talking about. But if you look at the pictures that I put up on our Instagram or Facebook uh, pages and accounts, you will see that the large seed tray and the two smaller seed trays from Haas Tools fit very nicely on a single shelf. And so if I add up the 168 in the larger tray plus the 48 in the two smaller trays on one shelf, I can get 216 plants or starts. Now, with the 1020 trays, I can fit four of them side by side uh, on a shelf, and each one of them hold 36 uh, soil blocks, and so I can only get 144 plants on a shelf using the 1020 trays. So, obviously, I can definitely get more in the Haas trays using the 168 cell plus the 248s on a shelf, um, but I wouldn't be able to do much more than that. Uh, for example, I, I wouldn't have enough room to put two of the 168 cell um, trays. I, I, I can't put two of those on a shelf. Um, and so I think the combination of those two really gives me the most bang for the buck space-wise. But what I do like better is the the flexibility. I shouldn't say if I like it better, but I also like the flexibility of the 1020 trays in that I can start smaller batches of transplants over time. And so, you know, I don't know. Um, we'll see how things progress through the uh through the growing season as I'm starting these transplants. But uh, I think there's pluses and minuses either way you go. I still think I probably am leaning a little bit more towards just using the soil blocks in the 1020 trays because the 1020 trays, even though they're 26 bucks for five, I think it was 26 bucks, something around that in that neighborhood. Um, the Haas Toolkit uh, all of that stuff cost me over a hundred bucks. I think it was like 120 bucks for both setups. Um, so I think it's a little bit better value proposition by the time you factor, even in your soil block maker, it might be a little bit better value proposition on the 1020 trays. Um, so we'll see how things go. But right now I'm happy with all of them. Uh, we'll just see how once once things start growing, whether or not we end up with the root bound situation in the smaller Haas kit and uh, how things play out in the, the larger seed starting kit because the cells are, they're, they're quite a bit smaller than the, the cells in the smaller seed starting kit or the soil blocks. 
Another thing that I've been working on this week is with regards to the garden is really planning out my garden in a way that I've never done before. So I right now am trialing a, a software that's used for mapping out a garden. And I'm not going to give you the name yet because I don't know whether or not I'm going to like it. And so we'll see. But if there's a software that you use to map out your garden, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if there's something that you've used and have really liked. But this was recommended by the person who did the uh, homesteading class discussion presentation, whatever you want to call it, at our library uh, a couple of weeks ago that I shared with you about. And so I figured I would give it a whirl. And so I'm going through right now and playing with it. I love the fact that it allows me to do both traditional gardening and square foot gardening. And so we'll see how things go. But if there's a software that you use, I'd love to know uh, about it and uh, take a look at it myself. But right now, my office is a disaster area. There's just seeds everywhere um, because I'm trying to go through and do this layout. Usually, I just wing it. In the past, what I've done is I've had a grid because... I use predominantly the square foot gardening method, so I would just draw grids of my bed, and then I would just go out there and plot plants wherever, and, you know, there really was no rhyme or reason to it. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit more thoughtful and take into consideration companion planting, although some of that I take with a bit of grain of salt, but I'm just trying to be a little bit more aware of that and also to think through uh, a better succession planting plan. And so hopefully the software will help me with that. Um, and I, if if things go well, then I will uh, tell you more about it. But uh, that is something else that I am working with right now. Finally, this week on the homestead, we uh, have someone who is interested in buying some pigs from us. And so this week I started the weaning process of the piglets that were born back in January. Now, usually I notch the ears almost the day or the day after they are born. And a lot of people don't understand why we notch pigs' ears. I notch pigs' ears for a couple of reasons. Number one is because... When they are first born, you can't give them uh, an ear tag. Their, their ears just can't handle it. And so usually when they're first born, what I want to do is I want to be able to I uh, start tracking kind of their growth. I, I do an initial inspection of them, obviously to see whether or not they're a male or a female, to look at the teats, how many teats they have, are the teats evenly spaced, um, just general confirmation of the piglet, although at a very young age, it's it's very difficult to tell everything, but I just do an initial evaluation of them, and so now I can start tracking which piglet uh, has, you know, X number of teats and it's a boy, and also sometimes what we have happen is we have uh, multiple litters on the ground at the same time, and our sows will co-mother. And so I will notch the ears so I know which piglets belong to which mom for registration purposes, but also just for record keeping purposes. But notching the ears also can be beneficial later on because you can put ear tags in and many people do put ear tags into their pigs. But periodically what can happen is those ear tags can get caught and ripped out. And now you're not quite sure which pig is which. I raise American guinea hogs. I have registered American guinea hog pigs. And we have actually had situations where they were, where they had pigs that they found where the ear tag had been ripped out, but because of how the ears were notched, they were able to identify the pig properly so that they could uh, use that pig for breeding purposes, where if they had just relied solely on the tag, then we would have lost those genetics to our herd book um, because we would not have any confirmation with regards to the uh, pedigree of that pig. So it's really for identification purposes, both for me in a record keeping, um, from a record keeping perspective. But also in the future, it's kind of a backup identification in case 
um, there's something that happens with the ear tag. And so all of that to say this week, I actually did the initial evaluation uh, that I normally would have done uh, a long time ago, but because this litter was born in January when it was cold out, I didn't really mess with them too much. Um, I did check to see whether or not there were boys or girls, but that was pretty much it. And so this week I did the initial evaluations, we notched the ears, and uh, now I have started the weaning process because I identified both a boy and a girl that I think are going to be good breeding stock, both from a confirmation perspective and from a personality perspective. The boy in particular is just this really super chill pig. When I would grab them from the mom, I grab them by the hind legs and I'm kind of holding them upside down as I transfer them to the next pen, which I wouldn't like that either. I would squeal too. Um, and the and the girl does squeal quite a bit. The boy is just totally chill. He's just like, okay, whenever you let me down, man, I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll be happy. But he really is a, a super chill little pig. Um, so I I I think they're both going to work out great. But my son and I did that evaluation and we've started that um, weaning process. And so that was another thing that we did here on the homestead this week. So that's what's been going on here on the homestead. A lot of stuff. And still, I wish I had gotten some more stuff done. But that's the way it always is. Uh, very, very happy, though, with where we are at on 3B Farm and Homestead. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. So this week, we are going to continue on with our Homestead Preparedness Series. And this is a bit of a follow-on to last week's series with regards to raising and growing food. And today what I want to talk about are 10 gardening mistakes people make. You see, I see there's a lot of people that are coming into the homesteading groups, the homesteading forums, who are brand new to gardening and who are trying to figure out where to start, how to start, what to do. And one of the other things that we are seeing is that a lot of the seed companies are selling out of seeds totally, or they have a very, very minimal number of seeds available for sale because there are so many people right now who are interested in raising and growing their own food. And that is awesome. I am so excited about that. I think that it's awesome to see people who are wanting to make a difference in their own lives and to have some level of food security. Obviously, many of these people are brand new to the idea of raising and growing their own food. They're brand new to the idea of gardening. Maybe their grandparents or maybe their great-grandparents, maybe even their parents grew a garden, but they haven't or they haven't done it in a very long time. And so on this episode, we're going to talk about 10 gardening mistakes people make and how to avoid making them. Because my goal is to help you be as successful as possible in raising and growing your own food. So number one, they don't know their first and last average frost dates. And folks, to me, this is probably the most key piece of information that you need to know if you are going to raise and grow your own food. Knowing your first and last average frost dates is going to help you know when you should start your seeds indoors. It's going to help you know when you should start seeds outdoors. And what happens many times, if you don't know your average first and last frost dates, you can start your seeds indoors too early, or you can start them indoors too late. You can start your seeds outdoors too early, or you can start them outdoors too late. You see, if you have a growing season, let's say it's it's an average growing season of 100 days, and you are trying to grow a variety that uh, takes 95 days, but you don't start that seed until, let's say, two weeks after your average last frost date, the math just doesn't work, right? 100 minus 14 gives you, what's that, 86 days? 
And if it takes 95 days to reach maturity, you've started that seed too late. So knowing your first and last average frost dates is very, very key because it's going to help you understand when you should start your seeds indoors for transplants and when you should direct sow seeds outdoors to ensure that you're going to actually be able to achieve a harvest. Now, yes, there are things that you can do to extend the growing season, but if you are brand new to gardening, don't worry about that right now. Because to me, that's advanced concepts that you might want to try in a couple of years. But right now, you really want to focus on being successful in your normal growing season. So how can you know your first and, average, uh, first and last average frost dates? Well, Mr. Google Pants, as Justin Rhodes refers to him, um, is very, very helpful with that regard. But I would recommend that you go to the far the old farmer's almanac many of us have seen that for years and years and years in the grocery store at the checkout lines um, but the old farmer's almanac has a planting calendar on their website almanac.com and you can just go there and it will help you know when your first and last average frost dates are but it will also help you know when you should start your seeds indoors. I mean, it's a very, very helpful guide um, that will give you some direction based. And I would, I would recommend you can base it on frost dates or base it on moon dates. I would just recommend you base it on frost dates. Okay, forget the moon date thing. Um, just focus on the frost dates and you will be in a great spot. But mistake number one is people don't know their first and last average frost dates. Number two, people plant varieties not suited for their zone. Now, there are things that are called hardiness zones. And if you go to uh, the USDA website, they actually have an interactive map there. The hardiness zones, what they do is they look at things beyond just the first and last average frost dates, but they also look at you know, how warm does it generally get? How cool does it generally get? Looks at maybe the climate in, in general, not just looking at frost dates. This is in particular very important with regards to your more of your perennials, certain trees and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, um, let me just use bananas. Bananas would not thrive in zone 5A, 5B, which is where I'm at. That's not going to be a good choice without me putting in place some kind of crazy greenhouse. I'm probably not going to be able to grow bananas in upstate New York. Now, that's a bit of um, an exaggeration because most people I understand are going to understand that upstate New York is not prime banana country. But there are certain varieties of vegetables, and I shared with this with you in a previous episode on gardening, uh, where I got caught by this with regards to a lima bean. I planted a lima bean. Um, I don't even remember what the variety it was. I should look it up. It doesn't matter. But this lima bean put out all kinds of vines, vines everywhere. It was luscious, beautiful. It never set one fruit. I never got a single pod off of that. And I was scratching my head trying to understand why that took place and then the next year, I was looking through the catalog, and I saw that bean, and I happened to notice something there that I hadn't noticed the year before. And it said, not adapted to northern climates. So even certain vegetables may not do well in your zone. And so you just need to be aware of that. Everything that Baker Creek sells is not going to do well for you. Everything that Fedco sells may not do well for you. You need to, There are certain things that are going to do well in the cool climates of Maine that would never do anything in the hot, humid summers of Alabama. Um, so knowing your, uh, your hardiness zone is going to be very helpful in you understanding what you can and what you should plant in your garden. But unfortunately, people don't know the hardiness zone, and so they plant varieties not suited for their area. Mistake number three, people direct sow seeds that should be started indoors. Things like 
peppers and tomatoes and your brassicas. So cauliflower, uh, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, um, things like that should generally speaking always be started indoors and then transplanted outside after they have been properly hardened off. And if you try to direct sow a tomato or a pepper out in uh, your garden, you probably are not going to achieve a harvest or the harvest that you achieve is not going to be what it could have been if you would have started it indoors and then transplanted it outside. On the other hand, also sometimes people try to start seeds indoors that really should be direct sown. So a lot of your, in my opinion, a lot of your root crops, your uh, beets and your parsnips and your carrots, potatoes, rutabagas, all those kinds of things should always be sown outside. But also things like bean, beans and corn and, and those kinds of things really, generally speaking, should always be direct sown. And so if you try to sow them indoors and transplant them, many times what will happen is they will die from what we refer to as transplant shock. Mistake number five is that people plant the wrong things. Now, what do I mean by that? I saw someone ask today on one of the homesteading sites, what are the top 10 vegetables I should be planting? And thankfully, the majority of people responded to that like this. Plant the things you like to eat. Don't plant things just to plant them. If you don't like radishes, don't plant a whole bunch of radishes. If you don't like onions, don't plant a bunch of onions. If you don't know how to use kale, then you might not want to plant an entire row of kale. Plant what you know. Plant the things that you enjoy eating. And then maybe experiment with a couple of different crops that you're not quite sure whether or not you might like them. Because there certainly is a difference between homegrown, uh, fresh harvested vegetables versus canned versions. For example, a friend of mine uh, thought that he hated asparagus because he thought asparagus tasted like the white stuff that comes in the can until he had fresh asparagus. He loves asparagus. He just didn't like canned asparagus. So keep that in mind. But on the other hand, if there are certain vegetables you just know you don't like, they don't agree with you, don't waste the space in your garden trying to grow things just to grow them. Grow what you like. Don't plant the wrong things. There's no right list of, uh, of vegetables that you should plant. My opinion is you should plant the things you like to eat. Period. Number six. Mistake number six you plant too much. Now, I made this mistake early on with zucchini. I bought some transplants uh, at the local feed store and they came in a six pack. I planted every one of them because I'm cheap like that. If I buy all the plants, I'm going to plant all the plants. That's just how I roll. And my grandfather looked at me and he said, Brian, I don't think you want to do that. I said, by golly, I bought these plants. We're going to use these plants. And so I planted all six of them in the garden. Didn't take me very long before I was pulling zucchini plants out of the garden. You know, they jokingly say that the only time people lock their doors in Vermont is during zucchini season. Uh, that I understand now. Um, because we had zucchini coming out our ears. And after a while, there's just so much, only so much you can do with zucchini. You know, you can only do so much zucchini bread and zucchini relish and fried zucchini and baked zucchini and stewed zucchini and zucchini lasagna and zucchini whatever kind of ways before you are sick and tired of zucchini. So mistake number six is that people plant too much. Now, how do you know how much to plant? That really is a difficult question to answer because a lot of it boils down to a how much do you like a particular uh, uh, vegetable 
Um, you may be very happy eating zucchini every night all the time. You may want zucchini once a week. I don't know what your family likes to eat. Part of it depends on how big your family is. And also part of it depends on what you plan on doing with these vegetables. Are you going to preserve them in any way? Are you going to uh, give them away? Are you going to sell them? Um, there's a lot of things that you can do uh, to deal with excess produce. But just be careful that you don't plant too much of one variety. If you do that, um, you will be pulling up zucchini plants just like I did. Mistake number seven, people try to fit too much in an area. People will plant things too close together and then they can't get down the rows to be able to harvest. They will have plants too close together and what ends up happening is those plants are competing with each other for, for nutrients. And so instead of having one healthy plant, you have two sickly plants. So make sure you pay attention to the spacing requirements. Most seed packets will have the spacing requirements on the back of them. But if they don't, take a look on, uh, you know, again on Google, and it will help you understand uh, how much you should plant in a particular area of a particular type of plant. Now, there are some times when you can kind of bend the rules a little bit, but if you're brand new to gardening, just do whatever it says on the seed packet uh, as you are getting started. Mistake number eight is that people either wait too long to harvest or totally forget to harvest. Folks, the vegetables are not going to wait for you. And if you don't harvest things when they're ready, they will go bad. Tomatoes will split. Uh, lettuce will bolt. Spinach will bolt. And by that means, it just means it's going to go to seed and it's not going to taste very good any longer. Um, so you need to make sure you're harvesting the vegetables when they are ready to go. Mistake number nine, planting only once instead of multiple times to achieve multiple harvests. I used to do this all the time, and that is I wanted to plant the garden once and be done with it. And so I would plant, let's say, a row of leaf lettuce that was 20 feet long. This is back when we were doing it down at my grandfather's. I'd plant a 20 foot long row of leaf lettuce. Well, then all of a sudden that leaf lettuce comes on. We're not going to eat. We know we're, my wife and I and our son, who was very young at the time, and my grandfather, we weren't going to eat 20 feet of lettuce all at one whack. Instead, I would have been better off to maybe plant five feet of lettuce this week and then in a couple of weeks plant another five feet of lettuce and then in another couple of weeks plant another five feet of lettuce and then in a couple of weeks plant another five feet of lettuce. So I've used the same 20 feet but now my lettuce is going to be coming on in a staggered fashion. And so we're going to be able to eat lettuce all summer long instead of having to eat salads for like crazy and then have no lettuce whatsoever because it's gone past. So mistake number nine is planting only once instead of multiple times to achieve multiple harvests. Mistake number 10 is trying to use a set it and forget it approach to gardening. Folks, there's a lot of great gardening methods out there that speak to minimizing the amount of work that you put into it. That's part of the allure of square foot gardening because it's an intensive method. Um, in theory, it's supposed to crowd out some of the weeds and it does do that, but that doesn't mean that you don't need to water. I'm sorry, you don't need to weed your garden. You're still going to need to do some weeding. Even if you're doing a Ruth Stout method or a Back to Eden method and you're using some kind of deep mulch, you are still going to need to do a minimal amount of weeding or application of wood chips or application of straw or hay or whatever it is that you're using for your deep mulch. But you're going to have to do some work. You may need to water your garden. Depending on what method you're using, where you're at, what your ambient temperature has been, how much rain you've gotten lately, but you are going to need to water your garden. 
And you may need, depending again on what you are planting and how you're doing it, you may need to feed your garden. In other words, apply compost or apply compost tea or manure tea or some kind of organic or commercial fertilizer, whatever it is that you feel comfortable doing, but you simply cannot set it and forget it. If you do so, it's going to come back to bite you in the butt and either the weeds are going to crowd out the good crops that you're trying to grow or things are going to die because they don't know, have enough water or you're not going to have as much production because you haven't fed the, the plants properly. So don't try to just set it and forget it. Any kind of gardening method is going to require some care. You're going to need to do at least some weeding, some watering, some feeding in order to achieve an abundant harvest. So let's go through that list one more time. Number one, people don't know their first and last average frost dates. Number two, they plant varieties not suited for their hardiness zone. Number three, they direct sow seeds that should be started indoors. Number four, they start seeds indoors that should be direct sown. Number five, they plant the wrong things. In other words, they don't plant the things that they like to eat. Number six, they plant too much. Number seven, they try to fit too much in an area, planting things too close together. Number eight, they wait too long to harvest or they forget to harvest at all. Number nine, they plant only once instead of multiple times to achieve multiple harvests. And number 10, they try to use a set it and forget it approach to gardening, forgetting to weed, water, and feed their garden. All of those are mis mistakes that quite frankly at times I have made. And so learn from my mistakes and don't make those mistakes and you will be well on your way to having a very successful uh, garden and that will help you be better prepared on your homestead. Folks, I know it's been a lot of information. This has been a longer episode than usual. Thanks so much for bearing with me. If you haven't already done this, I really would appreciate it if you would jump on over to iTunes or Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcasting platform is, and leave us a review or a thumbs up, something like that. Those kinds of things will help the podcast be found by other people. And also, if you could, share it with friends, neighbors, maybe even enemies. <laughs> um, but my goal is really to try to help as many people as possible on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. As always, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com, so a big, huge thank you to them. Until next time, keep up the good work.